Good morning. Today I'm excited to bring you a lesson. We're entitling this America in Reflection. Today we're going to look at a, the history of America. We're going to take a quick journey back in time and we're going to move from when our country was founded forward to today. And then we'll make application for trust in God and how we should demonstrate that trust in our lives. But as we get started this morning, before we begin this presentation, I've got to tell you that I've put a lot of time and I've put a lot of uh, research into this. And there's actually two schools of thought when it comes to the founding of our country. One school of thought is, is that God played a role in the foundation of our country. That God was at the center of that. That I believe that God um, was part of the foundation of our country. That has become known as the Christian belief. There are other groups out there that take a totally different view. And they believe our country was founded on anything but God. And so there's a debate out there of, Who's right and who's wrong? Well, today, for this lesson, I'm going to tell you that we are right. As Christians, we have the right view. I believe there's lots of evidence, more evidence than what we'll see today that supports the fact that God was a part of the founding of our country and has been a part of our country moving forward. Um, But we'll talk a little bit more about today. But let's take a... uh, a trip, if you will, back in history. Um, Today in history, let's look at the Liberty Bell. And what I want to do is, I want to show you evidence of where God has been placed in history, especially from the early days. I found this, uh, this bell... It's called our Liberty Bell. It resides today in what they call Independence Hall. And this bell, when it was commissioned and made, there were words etched on this bell that said, Proclaim liberty throughout the land unto all the inhabitants thereof. That verse is tied from historians and from those that were from this time, the historians have wrote that this is tied to Leviticus chapter 25, verse 10. We have the inspiration, we have part of a Bible verse that's on our liberty bell that can be seen even today. Is not Leviticus 25 part of God's inspired written word? Doesn't it look like even before our country was founded that God was playing a role in our country? Let's move forward a few years from 1772 to uh, 1776. This is July 4th. We just celebrated this this year, just a couple of weeks ago. We celebrated July 4th as our Independence Day. 56 men got together and they they met... Uh, they signed a what we call today a Declaration of Independence saying they wanted their independence from Britain. That they wanted to establish their own country. And so we have the writing of, of this Declaration of Independence and signed and put in place at this time. It's interesting to note that if you looked at the Declaration of Independence that God, a reference to God, is mentioned four times throughout this Declaration. It's referred to as the laws of the nature and natures of God. It's endowed by the Creator, Supreme Judge, and then it talks about divine providence. I find it interesting when you look at the Declaration of Independence, look at two references to God that we have right here. God as the Creator and God as the Judge. Are those not two major attributes of God? And these major attributes of God made their way into a historical document that we celebrate the signing of every year since. That's pretty cool to me. And 
these men that signed this declaration. Think for a minute what they were doing. The, the sacrifice. They left the comfort. They left the security of their home. They left what they knew and they came over to an unclaimed land. They came over to a place that was going to be full of hardships. They knew that when Britain found out what they were doing that there was going to be war that would follow. That there would be uh, difficult times. As a matter of fact, uh, we'll have a slide here in a minute that uh, many of these men that signed this died. Uh, some of their houses were burned. Some of them died in the war supporting this Declaration of Independence. They made that sacrifice. And it's referenced, that sacrifice is also referenced in the Declaration of Independence. But they had to put their hope somewhere. In this group of 56 men, they weren't perfect men. As a matter of fact, if you looked at these 56 men, their view of God probably, there was probably 56 different views of God in that room. But they chose to put their hope in God so that they would not have to face a hopeless situation. This is the sacrifice of our founding fathers. This, this monument is up and it is a historical, historical monument that actually talks about the sacrifice that the founding fathers made. I want to quickly move forward from 1776 to 1864. In 1864, a two-cent coin had the words, In God We Trust, stamped on that coin. This wasn't happenstance. This wasn't something that happened by accident. A group of men and women talked about this, probably debated over this, looked back over history and the founding of our country and said it's only right that God has played a part throughout our founding of this country now that we want these words in God we trust to be put on a coin. Several years later, in 1956, President Eisenhower says, you know what? We're going to make in God we trust a national motto. Look back again. This group looked back over history and said, look at the thread that runs through our founding uh, of our country moving through today. And look, God is at the center. He's at the forefront. Why not make God our national motto? In God we trust. In 1954, the Pledge of Allegiance went through a fourth amendment and the words under God were added to that pledge. In 1957, the words in God we trust were printed on the currency that you and I, we spend today. Have you thought about that in a while? You may want to pull out a piece of currency. You may want to look at that. Flip it over and look and see the words in God we trust and be reminded that as we handle that money, as we use that currency, that we're reminded of God and the trust that we're supposed to put in Him. A trust that we're supposed to demonstrate in our lives. In God we trust has made its way to different places um, in our federal and state buildings our beautiful facilities that we have that, that houses our government. This is uh, Washington, D.C. This is the Capitol Visitor Center. You see the words inscribed in this building, In God We Trust. Here, uh, you see it again with the House of Representatives in Washington, D.C. You see the words, In God We Trust, something that these people can see. And move forward now very quickly to the time of President Reagan. I, I heard this week, someone talk about President Reagan, and they listed him as one of our great presidents. They said he was a man that you could listen to. He was a wise man. He was a great president. This great president said these words, America was founded by people who believed that God was their rock of safety. Even Ronald Reagan looked back at the founding of our country and moving forward to his time, and he says, God... God was the founding. Uh, America was founded by people who believed in God. God was their rock. So, in these short slides, I don't believe there's any doubt, and there's, there's many, many more historical documents and, and evidence and, and uh, quotes from, from godly men that helped found our country coming forward that gives us evidence that God played a major role 
in the founding of our country, that he was given, uh, that he was thought about, that he was plugged in, that people looked to God for hope and for direction in building this country into what it is today. Freedom. As a result of signing the Declaration of Independence, as a result of what the wars that have been fought over the years, we have in this country what we call freedom. And we celebrate that again on July the 4th. We talk about this freedom, this independence that we have. And it's cost us more than we could ever put a price on. Freedom has cost the life. It cost the lives of hundreds of thousands of men and women who have fought for our freedom. Someone said that it is acknowledged, the flag flown is acknowledged by man, but is protected by God. I told you at the beginning of this lesson that there was, uh, there's two groups of people, there's two schools of thought about how our country was founded. One was with God, one is without God. Do you know that men and women have died? And this freedom gives these people, even though we may not agree with them, this freedom gives them the, the freedom to express their view, to have that thought and idea. If they don't agree with me, okay. I may not like it, but freedom was fought for these people as much as it was for me. A, a very hefty price was paid. Uh, today, we're not going to talk about war on the battlefield. We're going to quickly move forward now to our time today. I have put down here America under attack. Today, the real battle is not far off. The battle is at our home, in our backyard. Have you seen it? Have you read about it? Have you been affected by it? Our motto and our allegiance, what we stand for, is being taken away, and it's happening here on our own American soil. America is under attack, but it's not being attacked by Russia. It's not being attacked by China. It's not being attacked by some outside uh, country. We are devouring ourself. We are attacking our own self. And we're just slowly destroying the freedom that has been fought for for us to have. Man is determined to change our motto. Determined to, to rid that motto of, of being on our currency, in our schools, in our government buildings, courthouses, and all places in between. Any reference to God. Man wants to remove God from any reference uh, related to our country. Politics and religion. I was told that these two things never mix. And I, I wanted to put this up here. I want to show you the confusion today with our politicians. The first one is a positive one. This is uh, a representative Terry Weaver from Tennessee. Uh, Terry says that uh, he is for the national motto, and he thinks that uh, this will help future generations um, <clears throat> understand, better understand the importance of faith and remind them that the very bedrock of our nation was built on the principles uh, of the God of the Bible. This is a Christian representative that says, you know what, I believe our country was founded on God and I believe these godly principles will guide our country. Well, that's great. But there's a huge extreme from this all the way to the left. This is John Marty and Scott Dibble. They're Democrats, state senators from Minnesota. They opposed a bill asking schools to displace posters in the schools with the words, in God we trust. As a matter of fact, Marty would go a step further and he would say that the money in my wallet has to say, in God we trust. And I think that's offensive. Can you believe that's a view? What an extreme view we have. One view is, is that godly principles are the foundation of our country and shape who we are. All the way over here on this side that says that these words in God we trust are just offensive. Here right now, currently, uh, this month there is a lawsuit that's been filed in Mississippi. In Mississippi you can get a license plate that says the words, in God we trust, on a seal on your license plate. There is a group of people that's filed a lawsuit asking to remove these words, in God we trust, from the license plate. These words are under attack, even today. 
want to stop right here and I want to remind us that God has a warning for our country. This is the same warning that God had for other countries throughout history. If you want to continue your history lesson, you can go back and you can look at other countries. Countries that have risen and then fell. And God's warning was applicable to them and applicable even to us today. And we as America, we need to pay attention to this warning that God has for us. This warning is found written by Paul in Romans chapter 1. It's actually Romans chapter 1, 18 through verse 32. I would encourage you to go read that. And really, what that is, is um, as Paul is beginning his letter in Rome, he's letting these people know what a society looks like as it moves away from God. The dangers and what happens and the progression of, of just how far man goes as he moves away from God. Romans chapter 1, verse 18 says, The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all godliness and wickedness of men who suppress the truth by their wickedness. Truth is God. Paul says in 1, verse 18, he says that the wrath of God is being revealed against man who tries to suppress that God even exists. And it says... Uh, they suppress it through their wickedness. Verse 19 says, Since what may be known about God is plain to them, because God has made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, His eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that men are without excuse. Man has no excuse to claim that there is not a God. Man has no right to claim that God do not play a major role in the foundation of our country. And that our country was and should still be built on godly principles. It's interesting if you continue in that study, and we won't be able to do that today, if you look at society's progression away from God, the first step that society takes in moving away from God is they become thankless. Continue reading that in verse 21 and following. The second step that man takes and moving away from God is they elevate their reasoning above God. I can tell you right now, it can be proven very easily that we are a country that is moving away from God. Just based on those two things. We are becoming a thankless country. A thankless society. We're not thankful for what we have. The freedom that we have. We're not thankful for that. We are elevating every day. Man is continuing to elevate his reasoning above God. It's a dangerous place. And it's a warning for all of us. As a result of moving away from God, this is what we have. We all know about the riots that we've had. Here's a man burning a building and the American flag being walked in front of it. What a shame. Just this year, <clears throat> July 4th, they call it the bloody July 4th. National uh, holiday was marred by at least 150 people killed in more than 400 shootings across our country. This is a result of man not heeding God's warning and continuing to move and separate himself from God. <clears throat> For the time that we have left this morning, I want to return back to these words, in God we trust. Because they're on our currency. Uh, we see them... Uh, on different buildings. We have some of these words still being displayed in schools and different places and on license plates. But I want to tell you that in God we trust, in one sense, they're just words. They're just words. There is no authority to these words that we are talking about. They're just words. These words should not define us. Our living God calls you and I to live these words daily in our lives. So what if the American people change our national motto or write a fifth version of the plague, pledge? You know, <clears throat> if they remove in God we trust from our currency and from every building, everything that that they can, that move it from the license plate. You're not going to see me protest. You're not going to see me sign a petition. 
But what you're going to do is you're going to see me, and I hope you'll join me in this, is we're going to, as God's children, we're going to demonstrate that trust in our lives. We don't need that inscription on that currency. It's beautiful, and I'm glad it's there. But if it's taken away from us, they can't take away what's inside here. And that's where this idea of demonstrating these words in our lives. If we really believe these words in God we trust, maybe it's been a while since you've thought about these words, but if you really believe these words, then how do we demonstrate trust in our lives? We're going to go through some steps here of how we demonstrate trust in our lives. And the first step is, is we have to love God. And the thread that runs through these Uh, these points that I'll be bringing out this morning of how we demonstrate trust. Notice the action that's required for these. In this one right here, I went to the greatest place we could go. I went to um, Luke chapter 10, verse 27, where it says, uh, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. And love your neighbors as yourself. You see, if we love God, we've got to love Him with everything we've got. But did you notice the action that's required on our part? If we love God, not only are we going to love God with all of our being, we're going to love Him with all of our heart and with all of our soul and with all of our strength. And then we're going to do something else. The second greatest commandment is this. Love your neighbor as yourself. We're going to reach out to those people in need. We're not going to be able to contain the love of God with inside of us. We're going to share it. We're going to demonstrate that love to others we come in contact with. It's not something that we can hold inside. It's something that we're going to live out in our Christian life. It's something we're going to demonstrate as we move around in our community and in our state and in our country. If we're going to demonstrate these words in God we trust in our life, we have to love God. and We have to love our neighbors. Imagine right now, if we as a people believe this, if society believed these words right here, and if society practiced this right here, those slides that I showed you previously of the burning building and of all the blood that was shed this year, that would be gone. That would be significantly, it would be something that would just be insignificant. If we love God, we're going to demonstrate our trust in God by being obedient to God, by obeying God. Uh, Jesus says in John chapter 14, verse 23, anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. My Father will love them and we will come to them and make our home with them. Jesus said anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. It's connected to what we just talked about. We, our trust in God begins with our love for God and our love for our neighbors. But it moves... Even forward, as Jesus said, anyone who loves me, you're going to obey my teaching. You're going to obey my commands. And then I love what he says. My Father will love them and we will come to them and we'll make our home with them. Obedience in itself is is action. We can't just come to church and sit in the pew and call ourselves obedient and never, never talk about God, never share God in our community, never live it out in our lives. Obedience is action within itself. Peter, in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 14, says, So you must live as God's obedient children. Don't slip back into your old ways of satisfying your desire, uh, your own desire. You did not know any better then. Here's a warning for us. Peter warns us, the Bible is very clear from Genesis to Revelation. There, we have a choice. We can choose to obey or disobey, but the warning is, is don't disobey God. We as God's children, we demonstrate our trust in God when we show God we love Him, we show the world that we love God, and that we're obedient. And then there's a transformation that takes place. As we love God, as we move to obey God, then I think about Romans chapter 12, verse 2. It says, Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the the renewing of your mind we move to a point in our relationship with God where we ask God, God, please transform me. Lord, when I move about Camden, Arkansas, Lord, please please let it be evident. Let, let me demonstrate my trust in You. Let it be evident 
to, to the community that I live and that I work in. And when people see me, they see something different. That they see you in my life. Lord, please help transform me. And he says that if we allow God to transform us, then you will be able to test and prove what God's will is. His good, pleasing, and perfect will. So we move from love and then obedience, and then we are working on being transformed. And as we become transformed by God, we can understand and make application to these words found in Ephesians 5.1. It says, imitate God, therefore, in everything you do, because you are His dear children. As we move from love to obedience to transformation, we now begin to imitate God in our life. Again, making it evidence to those that we come in contact with. People look at us and they can know that man, that woman, they trust God. They completely trust God in their life. Imitation not only involves coping with external behavior, but also replicating internal motivation. You can go to the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and our motivation for imitating God can be found in Jesus. We need to learn to pray like Jesus. We need to learn to be compassionate like Jesus. We need to be familiar with Scripture like Jesus was. We need to set an example for the world like Jesus did. That's all part of this uh, imitating God in our lives. There's action involved in each one of these things that we discuss. And then lastly, we love God. We obey God. We continue to allow God to transform us and we live our life in a way that we imitate God as we move throughout our community. And I like this. I found this passage in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 1 and 2. And my heading at the first of that chapter says, Live for God. And I found these beautiful words. Therefore, since Christ suffered in His body, arm yourselves also with the same attitude, because who has suffered in the body is done with sin. As a result, he does not live the rest of his earthly life for evil human desires, but rather for the will of God. This passage says that as we demonstrate our trust in God, these words, in God we trust, are more than just words found on currency, are more than just words found on a building. We are living them out actively in our life. We're living for God. He said he doesn't, that when we get to this point, we no longer live for the earthly life, but we live uh, to satisfy the will of, of God, our Father. As we live for God, Later on in 1 Peter chapter 4, 7 and 10, you'll see these words, be self-controlled, clear-minded, and pray. And notice this, it says that if we speak, speak the very words of God. If we serve, do it with the strength of God. Again, there's action involved in living for God. We can't just exist and people know that God is living in our lives. We have to demonstrate it as we walk around our community, as we live, and as we work. These are just words. There's no authority to them. Those words should not define us. Our living God calls you and I to live these words daily in our lives. So what if America changes our national motto? What if they write a fifth version to the pledge and they remove the words under God? And they take in God we trust away from us as our motto. It should still be evident that God exists because millions of Christians demonstrate God in their lives daily. And we demonstrate our trust in God. We live out these words in God we trust by loving God with all our heart, with all of our soul, and with all of our strength. And then we love our neighbors as ourselves. We move to be in obedience to God. And we demonstrate our love for Jesus by obeying His commands, by being obedient. We move to a transformation where we allow God to transform us daily so we understand what His will is. And then we live out imitating this transformation that we're going through in our lives for the world to see. We want to look different. We want to talk different. We want to act different than our society. We want to share Jesus in the way that we live. We want to demonstrate that in our lives. And ultimately, as we learn to live out these words in God we trust, God becomes one that we live for. In God we trust. I want to ask you this morning as we conclude, I want to talk about this word trust for just a moment. 
Do you trust God? Are you listening more to society than to God? Are you spending time in His Word? Are you spending time with family and friends? With the spiritual side, are you, you know, are you demonstrating trust in your life? Trusting God can be difficult. I have met and encountered people over the last few months that are really struggling with this idea of trusting God. So, I ask you this morning, do you trust God? Maybe you're like, well, yeah, I think I do. But yet, you haven't made that decision yet. You aren't a Christian. You're listening today and you're saying, yeah, I I believe these words in God we trust. Well, then I want to ask you, if you really believe it, then you need to make Him the Lord and Savior of your life. Because trust begins when we make that decision. When we... uh, when we repent of the life that we live, when we confess Jesus as Lord and Savior of our life, when we give our life to Him, when we are baptized for the forgiveness of our sins. And we would love to share that with you. If you're listening today, you can call our church office and we'd love to find somebody that can sit with you and study with you and let you begin this relationship of trusting God. Maybe you're listening today and and you struggle with this. I want to ask you to go back and look at these passages of transformation. Are you allowing God to transform you? Are you obeying God? 